Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Salvation Basics on this Sunday, 15th August, 2021. I hope you had a good week uh, before and that you're looking forward to the new one and that you're looking forward to uh, preaching the Word of God. Uh, today, my message is uh, entitled, Should Death Be Fearful? Right? Should Death Be Fearful? Uh, we've got two key texts, um, the first from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, and the second from Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, the word of God reads, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And Acts chapter 17, verse 11, uh, the word of God reads, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Right? May the Lord uh, bless the reading of his word. Uh, let's go to the uh, Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time to be, um, to be back in this class and uh, for the preaching of this class. Father, thank you for those who are here uh, listening to your word. Uh, I just ask that you bless them uh, with understanding and bless them with a mind and a heart uh, to to be uh to receive your word to hear your word and um and that you also give them a reasoning mind to reason um uh this message from uh with rather the, your with your word and that they will be like the Bereans um who were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures whether these things were so um, so, Lord, we commit this time into your hands. We pray for the uh, uh, presence of the Holy Ghost, uh, even now as we commit this prayer into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, last week I spoke about someone who asked if being in a bad situation was because of something bad that was committed or done. Right, I hope my message made it clear from scriptures that that was not always the case. Some bad situations may be deserved. Uh, others may not be. But whatever the case may be, I encourage everyone to remember and meditate upon the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in that he would rather glory in his infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon him because his grace is, is sufficient for all. all right? um, also, last week uh, was a sermon of a reasoning faith preached by Pastor Jesse. Uh, with the main text also taken from Acts chapter 17, verse 11, uh, uh, um, which is part of our main text today, all right? Um, but for today, I want to speak brief, uh, briefly about death, all right? For those of you who know me better, you will know that it's one of my lesser-known uh, pet subjects, but it's still my pet subject, or one of my pet subjects, and something that I often joke about uh, with, with other brethren about, uh, who will get to go home first, right? Who will get to go home first? You know, I was thinking about what to preach today, and I asked the Lord about that. Uh, about that. And as usual, he answered uh, when some brethren and I, uh, 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 rather he answered when uh, uh, some brethren I often chat with discuss that subject um, um, uh, just yesterday. You know, uh, the subject of death that seems so thorny to some people, but yet something that I and the said brethren actually look forward to. Um, yes, you know, it may sound morbid, but I look forward to the day that I'm no longer in this body. And, but before I continue, you know, what does, and what does Acts chapter 17 verse 11 have to do with death? You know, on the surface, seemingly nothing. But it has everything to do with what God says, uh, uh, says to us uh, from his holy scriptures. And I pray that all of you will have the readiness of mind to receive this message and then go searching the scriptures if, the, if these things are so, right? But hey, don't take my word for it. Who knows if I cherry pick some bits of scriptures here and there, as some people are so want to do, W O N T, right? Want to do, and then cobble them together uh, um, and form some heretofore unheard of theology, right? Um, you know, in our world of information overload uh, from our mobile, dev uh, 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 mobile dev uh, uh, devices, I strongly encourage you, uh, if you don't already have it, to download 
a KGV application onto your phones, onto your, uh, onto your, your whatever mobile device you use. Um, and something that you can search, all right? You can find them online readily, whether you're using Android, whether you're using iOS, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, if you haven't got it, go ahead, download it. You know, it, it makes searching very, very easy. Uh, there are some reference uh, material out there also that can be of uh, a benefit to you. Um, um, why? All right. Why? You know, in in Second Timothy chapter three verse fifteen, uh, Paul told told Timothy. And that from a child, thou has known the Holy Scriptures. You know, Timothy was taught the Holy Scriptures when he was a kid, when he was a child. And, and the Holy Scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in, in Christ Jesus. All right? Uh, uh, what this means is that the Holy Scriptures tell you what you are, who you are, who God is, what God is, what sin is, what you need to do to get right with God, right? Uh, it's the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. Reading the Holy Scriptures doesn't save you, right? But it will make you wise unto that salvation which is through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, oh, Brother Roy, does this mean that, you know, repentance is not needed because repentance is not, is not um, uh, mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15? Absolutely not. It, hey, you've got to read the scriptures from cover to cover. Just because it does not appear here in this passage doesn't mean it's not required. And hey, in, in other passages like Acts chapter 20, uh, no, um, uh, uh, like what Jesus said, all right, uh, unless you repent, you will likewise perish, all right? Jesus mentioned repentance, but he didn't mention faith. Does this mean that repentance is all you need and, faith, and not faith? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You put what Jesus Christ said, and then you take what Paul said, you put them together, you realize that both are needed, right? Both are needed, all right? Anyway, um, I'm just going to jump right into my first point, you know, uh, of, my, of my message, should death be fearful? My first point being, what is death, right? Death is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, and was last mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, all right? In Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 17, the Word of God reads, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God told Adam, God instructed Adam, uh, commanded Adam uh, uh, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because in the day that he does it, uh, that he will surely die. See, the word of God says, surely die. But in Genesis 3, um, the serpent, Satan, uh, uh, put a question mark to God's, you know, he, he, he questioned God's word. He basically called God a, God a liar. But then again, Eve also said, um, uh, uh, Eve, Eve either confused it or she, she, she misquoted God's word. But anyway, what Eve said was, lest thou should die. It's not lest, it's not in case you die. God said, thou shalt surely die. And Satan said, no, you will not die. But your eyes will be open and you'll be like gods. All right, but that's, a for, that's, that's, that, that's for another day, right? So again, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know, having an understanding of this passage with the events of Genesis chapter 3, 
reveals that it cannot be a physical death because neither Adam nor Eve died on the day they ate, they, they ate the forbidden fruit. What happened was they got banished from the Garden of Eden, which is a picture of spiritual death, which is the separation of man from God. Uh, however, both Adam and Eve did eventually die a physical death. And the Bible described that physical death as a separation of the soul of the individual from his or her body. Right? Genesis chapter 35, verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Right? For she died. All right? So if I were to understand Genesis chapter 2, verse 17 and 35, verse 18 together, I would surmise that death was not God's plan for man. And that separation of man's soul from his body is not something that's natural, right? It's not something that God intended. But, but God had to lay down the penalty for disobedience. All right? God had to lay down the penalty for, for, you know, for sin. Now, at this point, I want to strongly emphasize that God gave man every right to exercise his freedom. All right? God is not a God that ties up your hands and bashes you about and say, you must do this. You must not do something. No, you must, you must only do this and I will not allow you to do anything else. He gave man freedom. But as I've preached before, no exercise is free of, con of consequence. Right? No action is free of, con of consequence. The consequence of obeying God or is continuing fellowship with Him. The consequence of sin, of disobedience, is broken fellowship and separation from God and all that comes with that separation, such as a physical death. All right? And hey, if you die, still in sin, then it's not, just, it's not just a separation from God, it's eternal separation from God. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 reads, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, all men for that all have sinned. Okay? So, other than spiritual death and physical death, um, there's also what scriptures call the second death, which is the eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. All right? But where, but where real believers are concerned, the second death is, is, will never be an issue. All right? Where real believers are concerned, the second death does not concern them at all. The second death concerns those who pass from this life to the next without the cleansing blood of Christ. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. All right? Hey, you know, Jesus Christ on his great white throne was so fearsome was so, you know, that the face of the earth and heaven fled away and there was no place, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. So, you know, far, far as God is concerned, far as Christ is concerned, when you stand before his great white throne, it doesn't matter who you, are, who you were, who you are. All right? And I saw the dead, great and small stand before God and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those, uh, those things which are written in the books according to their works. According to their works, we will be judged according to our works. The saved will be judged. The lost will be judged. There's no exception. All right? Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up, de uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
and whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, the second death. And Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 reads, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right? Unbelievers, lost people, when, you know, after the great white throne judgment, they will be thrown into the lake of fire, which burneth forever. And this is the second death, which does not touch believers. Real believers, I say. All right, let me qualify. They are real believers and they are fake believers. Because of sin, man is born in a state of spiritual separation from God. All right, Psalm chapter 51, verse 5 reads, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All right, and Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed, passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And Romans chapter 3, uh, 3 verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, as I preached last week or week before, before, with the exception of Jesus Christ, no one is born sinless and sin-free. The psalmist wrote, Behold, I was shapen in, in, in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Sin passed, uh, sin entered into the world by one man, and death by sin. Death is the result of sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. All right, so when we are born, we are born in a state of spiritual separation from God. We are all born sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, coming back to the events in the Garden of Eden, you know, we see the mercy and grace of God towards humanity. God would have been righteously justified to have instantly judged the erring pair and destroyed them utterly for the rank disobedience. Had he done that, none of us would be here. And I won't be preaching this message because, you know why? Because the scripture says, God rested from his work of creation. All right? If God had judged Adam and Eve according to their sin, and wasn't merciful about uh, 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 to them. That's it. All right, we won't be here. G look at Genesis chapter two, verse two. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made. God ended His work, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. The word rested does not mean God took a break. Right? The word rested is defined as ceased, des desisted. God's work of creation was done, was finished, done for good. All right? We are here. You and I exist today because God gave man another chance according to his infinite grace. That chance is the chance at repentance. Remember one of my favorite passages from the Bible? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? All right? Between the time we are born and the time we die, we have the tremendous God-given opportunity at repenting of our sin and running to Christ tr to trust upon his finished works on the cross to save us and redeem us back to God. But do not think that the door of opportunity remains open forever. Man will die a physical death, after which he will be judged by the righteous judge. Another of my favorite passages, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and as it is appointed unto man, unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. At the end of the judgment, man has two possible domains that he will go to. All right? Not three, not four, two. One is to be in the presence of God if he is saved. The other is the lake of fire if he is not saved. The other is the second death in the lake of fire. So, 
So what is death? All right, three. There, you know, you know, um, there are three deaths that I can that I can that I can think of. One is a physical death, which is a separation of the soul from the body. The other one is uh, a spiritual death, which is a separation from of man from God. The other one, the last one, is a second death, the eternal death. All right, which is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. You know, in the in the in the in the in the, in the spiritual death that we are all born and we're born into spiritual death because we are all separated from God for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? There is the opportunity for any one of us to get saved, all right? And the moment we are saved, the second death, the eternal separation from God is forever erased, all right? That's a physical death. What is death? Death, well, physical death, separation of body from, from uh, bo- soul from body, spiritual death, separation from God, eternal death, eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. All right? Um, and the second point being the fear of death, right? Should death be fearful? Should death be fearful? You know, when it comes to the subject of death, it is not something to be openly discussed by a lot of, you know, rather, rather some people do not want to discuss the matter. Shh, death, no, 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 no. Knock on wood, touch wood. Don't bring, don't bring bad luck upon us by talking about death. It is taboo. People treat it with utmost superstition, hoping for long physical lives. Right? That fear is clear in how people strive to stave off aging. All right? Hey, you know, um, um, whether you're a man or you're a woman, uh, there are products, there are cosmetic products to, to keep your skin as young as possible. There's Botox, there's this, there's that. You know, cosmetic surgery, blah, blah, blah. Then there's oil of ole, uh, humorously called oil of delay, right? And people do whatever they can to remain healthy, to stay healthy, like taking this vitamin and that supplement, going for annual medical checkups to soothe themselves that they are not in any condition that will see them in the grave anytime soon. Or they catch something, or they hope to catch something early enough that a problem may be medically arrested. You know, honestly speaking, I don't have a problem with taking care of oneself. But the bad news is this, that, you know, regardless of what you do, what you take, what you apply on yourself, you know, the bad news is that all of us will die one day. The only difference being, or, you know, the, 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 on, the only thing between those who try to stave off aging and all that sort of thing and try to prolong their lives by this and that uh, is the erroneous perception that judgment is delayed. All right? Judgment is delayed. But the thing is, what is, you know, if you think about it, what is, say, 10 years, 20 years, when compared to all eternity, there's no delay at all, right? There's no delay at all. You're not going to tell somebody when you're burning in the lake of fire, hey, guess what? You know, I'm 20 years later coming to this place. I'm sorry. You, you know, you are in this place. You are in this horrible, you know, horrible, horrible place, and there's no escape. Right, so why does man fear death? The fear of death, right? Why does man fear death? Spiritually, spiritually speaking, there's innate knowledge that they are, they are in trouble with God. All right? They are in trouble with God because of his impending fiery judgment. All right? Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. The word of God reads, for 
the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, the word hold is to suppress, right? Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that, which may be, uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, all right? Things that may be known of God is manifest in us, for God has showed it unto us. Hey, it is imprinted upon us. It is imprinted in us. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. God tells you, you are without excuse. But Brother Roy, guess what? You know, these people have never heard the gospel of of Christ before. They were born in some island, blah, 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 blah. Well, the word of God tells us otherwise. For that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So what does man do? Man, you know, instinctively knows that they are in trouble. Instinctively know that, hey, you know, dying is not a good thing. So instead of doing honest business with God, he creates his own gods to placate the guilt-stricken conscience. Look at the same chapter of Romans, but verses 21 through 25. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts, uh, and their foolish, foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, there are lots of smart people, out, clever people, intelligent people out there who make stupid statements, who believe stupid things. Oh, there's no God. God can't be like this. God is all love. Surely God cannot um, uh, uh, banish me to an eternity in the lake of fire. There must be more than one way to God. God shares the heaven with other gods. I don't have to believe in him. Blah, 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 blah. All right? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. In verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What does it sound like? Doesn't that sound like the other religions on earth? Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their uh, their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Hey, man knows the judgment of God. Man knows he is in trouble. The truth of God is made known to us. That which may be known of, that which may be known of God is manifest, is manifest in us. But instead of doing proper business and honest business with God, we make our own gods and we bow ourselves down to those gods. God of money, false gods, idolatry, whatever that takes our mind off the real issue. The real issue is our spiritual status with God, our standing with God. All right? So, so coming back to Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, all right? They, made, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible, man, uh, to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. All right, what does that, what, what is that like? They then bow themselves down to it. All right, it's like Israel. Israel was, was miraculously brought out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, out of suffering. And what did they do? They craved their own graven images. 
They asked Aaron, Aaron, make us gods and we'll bow ourselves down to worship the, those gods. It's like somebody standing on train tracks and seeing a freight express barreling down on him and instead of stepping out of the way, he, remain, he remains where he is and digs a hole and sticks his, ho- his head into the hole, hoping not to see the train. The perception of not seeing the imminent danger does not change the fact that the express train will eventually make mince meat of anyone in its way. Does that make sense? If I see a car coming towards me, I'm in danger of being hit. All right? What should I do? Jump out of the way, right? But what does man do, professing themselves to be wise? They dig a hole in the road and stick their heads in there and say, well, hey, if I don't see the problem, I'm not going to get hit. Remember I said that there's no hiding from God? I encourage you to read Ezekiel chapter 8. All right? Regardless of what you do, regardless of what you say about yourselves, there's no hole deep enough or dark enough that God cannot go to and that his light was not able to shine. All right? Ezekiel chapter 8. I encourage you to read that. God brought Ezekiel in a in a you know in a vision um, and show and show Ezekiel what uh, you know what the leaders of Israel were doing what the religious uh, leaders of Israel were doing and God called those things abominable all right now the religion and self righteousness will not stop or change the express train of God's judgment I've preached ever so often. It is not by our own righteousness that makes us acceptable to God. It is fessing to God what he wants you to fess up to. If I make use of vernacular, you have to see yourselves as, as as how God sees you because his righteousness does not change. And there's no snowball's chance that you can ever get him to see you according to your righteousness. Else he would never have said anything about imputing righteousness upon the, upon the repentant believer. And speaking of self-righteousness, right? I wonder why the subject of death is also taboo among some so-called believers. I mean, didn't Jesus Christ die to save the world? You know, a brother shared that, he, that a professing believer got defensive Right? Defensive. When he shared with her that real believers are not fearful of speaking the truth, even under threat of death. That defensiveness can only come from the fact that the person was confronted with something that she was uncertain of and that it was brought on by fear. You know, what did Jesus say in the scriptures? The truth shall make you free. Right? The truth shall make you free. And if the truth shall make you free, it, you know, you are free. But why does this person, or why did this person become defensive? You know, I've had people get defensive with, uh, de- uh, defensive with me when I speak of certain things from scriptures. Hey, hey, hey you cannot judge, you know. We are believers. We are Christians. We go to church. We do this. We do that. Well, the thing is that, how about this? How about being a Berean? If somebody says something to you, and it's from scriptures, rather than getting defensive, how about thanking the person, and then opening the Bible, and then searching things for yourself? All right, the same brother also shared that he knew, you know, um, or rather, another brother. Another brother shared that, some, that 
a so-called Baptist deacon freaked out when he wanted to preach death and didn't want him to preach it. The question is, why not? Why not? How can you possibly, as a Baptist deacon, all right, you think about, when you think about deacon, when I, when I think about deacons, I think about Stephen, who was bold, who was courageous. For the sake of lost souls, he preached, and he preached the truth, and he preached the truth under threat of death. He preached the truth until he was stoned to death. All right? But what really, what I can't wrap my, 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 my brain around is how can a so-called Baptist deacon freak out at the preaching of death? How can you possibly preach the gospel of Christ without preaching death? Are we going to die? Absolutely. Hey, don't preach that, you know. People don't like to hear it. I'm sorry, as I said before, it's, if it's in the Bible, I'm going to preach it. If Jesus preached it, why can't we? Oh, because you're not Jesus, you know. Then how can I possibly, how can any one of us possibly, you know, preach the gospel if people take that sort of line, you know, if people uh, 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 take that sort of stand, you're not Jesus Christ. Well, in that case, hey, we can forget the Great Commission, right? Jesus Christ would say, go and preach in my name, baptize in the name of the Holy, you know, in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The same brother who shared about the, about the Baptist deacon also shared that he knows he knew some supposed believer who objected to the lyrics of Amazing Grace. Who said that the lyrics were negative. How can that, how can that be negative when John Newton wrote about the immeasurable mercy and unfathomable grace of God that saves? that saved a wretch like me. Why the fear if one is truly saved? You, Brother Roy, you know, you shouldn't talk about this because it's not nice to hear. All the more reason I should be preaching it if it's not nice to hear. Because the word of God is offensive to the unbeliever. The word of God is offensive to the self-righteous. You know, genuine believers have nothing to fear regarding scriptural truth, truths because of God and because of his spirit within us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and then Romans chapter 8, verse 16. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you possess the Spirit of God, then you have power, you have love, and you have a sound mind. But certainly not fear. God had not given us a spirit of fear. Again, coming back to, you know, you know again, speaking of deacons, look at the fearlessness, the fearlessness of Stephen, who without fear and in, with, with power and with love and of a sound mind, he preached the gospel of Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verse, six, uh, verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we are the children of God, how can we possibly fear scriptural truths? How can we say the lyrics of Amazing Grace are negative? All the more reason I ought to tell people how amazing God's grace is when he saved me, a wretch like me. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
the only reason, you know, that professing believers, the only reason amongst profe- professing believers for that fear of death is that their professions were empty. They have trusted in a prayer or were led to say something that they knew nothing of or, un- or, under- un- or understood little of and that there's no witness of the Spirit within them that tells them that they are saved. They have yet to trust in Christ. Instead, they found their faith upon the sands of work and self-righteousness and not on the rock of repentance of sin and faith in Christ. Realize this. Salvation is underwritten by God by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the premium for that underwriting costs nothing more than repentance and faith. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. All right? Fear of death. Man fears death because man is in trouble with God. Let me be a bit, let me be a bit more specific. Man fears death. Rather, lost man fears death because he is in trouble with God. Because he's condemned already. John chapter 3. Right? He's condemned already. But hey, guess what? What stops him? What stops him from doing proper business with God? His pride. (laughs) I preached this before. What stops us is pride. Pride in our own self-righteousness. Pride in our own works. There's no difference. There's no difference between them and Cain. Cain brought proudly before God the works of his own hands. And he presented the works of his own hands. I'm not saying that his works were bad. He probably brought the, you know, he brought the best of his works. And he presented them before God. He probably worked hard. He toiled and he sweated. And he showed it to God and God said, see God, Look at all the good things that I have brought to you. And God said, no, not good enough. Not good enough. So, but coming back, you know, to, to, I just want to underscore this, underline this, you know, highlight it. I scratch my head And I wonder why there are professing believers who are no different, you know, know, who, who believe, or rather, who are so afraid about death and who are so afraid about speaking about death. To whom death is taboo. Why? And I said, and as I said, the only reason that I can think of is that they are not saved. It is a subject that they are fearful of because they haven't got the Spirit of God in them telling them that they, that they are the children of God. So instead of going to God and say, God, why am I fearful? I've been a believer for so many years now. I prayed the prayer. I come to church. I give tithes. Tithes. But yet, why do I fear death? Why am I so fearful? Why am I troubled? And when confronted with the the truth, rather than dealing honestly with that truth, they get all defensive. They shoot at the messenger. No, they shoot at the messenger. They call the messenger unloving. Oh, you must speak truth in love. To them, love is not about speaking the truth. To them, love is molly coddling them, soothing their guilty conscience. 
telling them, telling them things that they want to hear. Not wanting to deal with the truth. But the thing is that all real believers are passed from death to life. For the real believer, death is nothing to be feared, to, to be feared but something to look forward to. How so? Here are two scriptural reasons. One of them is our key text for today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. We are willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Scriptural reason number one, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Scriptural reason number two, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, for I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. How is it far better? Paul affirmed that a physical death meant presence with God, with, with Christ. And he said that to leave, and he said that to leave this tabernacle is far better because it means that he will be with Christ. Why is it far better? Hey, don't you want to be with your Savior? Don't you want to be in his presence? Don't you want to be free from this body of sin? Free from this body of corruption? Free from this body that suffers pain, that breaks down? Would you rather prefer to be in this, in this body? Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body, from the body of this death? Things that he would, he would not. And things that he would not, he would. There's always this conflict in, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, in the believer. Because, there's, because, he has two, because, because he has two natures. The first nature being the natural nature, the natural man. He is in, you know, this body. The other nature is the nature of the Spirit of God. And, it's, and, and these two are always in conflict because they cannot agree with, with, you know, with, 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 uh, with each other. So isn't it better to be shot of this body? For those reasons that I just stated, I want to be shot of this body. I want to be home with Christ. Hey, but don't get me wrong. I'm not going to jump off a building or stand in front of a speeding train or, or, whatever, or, or what have you. Because that's sin. I will have to wait for my appointment. I will have to wait for my appointed day before I see my Savior. Did Jesus Christ die in vain? God forbid. Did he die in vain for, 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 for us? God forbid. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and, uh, and 15. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself took, uh, likewise took part of the same. He took part of the same. He became flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that, have, that had the power of death. That is the devil. Who has got the power of death? The devil. Because of sin, death came, no, death entered into the world. In verse 15, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hey, listen, your fear of death is bondage. The truth has not, has not made you free if you call yourself a believer today and you're still in fear of death. Jesus said, you know, Jesus by his death, no, no, nay, by his resurrection forever defeated the power of death. Jesus Christ resurrected, right? If Jesus Christ is still in his tomb, then death hasn't been, de been defeated yet, but he resurrected. Death has no power over Jesus Christ. And by the same token, the power of death has no power, or rather death has no power over the believer. Why to be absent from this body is to be present with God. 
No, if Jesus defeated forever the power of death, then how is it? Why is it that some professing believers fear death? Isn't it oxymoronic that out of the corner of one, of, of one mouth, they should say they believe in Jesus? They have faith in Jesus? They have faith in Jesus to save them, that they have the eternal life? But yet out of the, the, out of the other corner of their mouths, they fear the thing Jesus delivered them from. Isn't this hypocrisy? John chapter 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. All believers are passed from death unto believe, uh, 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 sorry, from death unto life. And I, l- let me just let me just correct myself there. All, be, all real, genuine believers are passed from death unto life. Jesus himself said to the believers pa, that the real believer is passed from death unto life. Even though his physical body dies, all right, he has everlasting life. He shall not come into condemnation. The word everlasting means precisely that, eternal. This should put to rest the argument from some quarters that one can lose his salvation. If one can lose one's salvation, then salvation is not everlasting. And this means that God is a liar. Or rather, these people who say that you know, whoever says that you can lose your salvation calls God a liar. Because Jesus said, hey, he that believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. If you can lose your salvation, then how can that be everlasting? Then God, then God has, well, it's, it's, it's one or the other. It's either God is a liar or the man is. And there can only be one answer to that. Romans chapter 3, verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The psalmist spoke of his confidence in God instead of of himself. Psalm chapter 23, verse 4. Famous psalm. Right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, coincidentally, is today's uh, uh, scripture reading for the, you know, for the main service. Pass from death to life. As such, I question the spiritual state of any professing believer who fears death because their fears declare God a lie. If God is a lie, then, you know, then, then, hey, logically speaking, these people cannot be saved if God is a liar. If God is a liar, then these professing believers have believed in a lie. Right? Should death be fearful? If you're lost today, absolutely, it ought to be fearful. You ought to fear. Because your death can occur at any time. But if you are a genuine believer, if you've truly repented of your sin, if you've truly put your faith in Christ to save you, then hey, fear is, you know, rather death is not a fearful thing. In fact, death is a thankful thing. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. You know, in closing, I just want to say that the real believer should not be fearful of death. And that's exactly what I said earlier. If anything, the real believer, the real believer looks forward to the day that he departs his, ta- his tabernacle for a couple of reasons. And I've stated those reasons before. To be present with the Savior forever and that he's no longer in this corrupt body that suffers pain, aging, and sin. Right? But what of the believer, uh, rather, but what of the unbeliever? The fear of death can today become a non-issue through repentance of sin and faith in Christ. The believer, the real believer, the genuine believer, the saved believer suffers only a physical death. 
nothing more. Because his name is written in the Lamb's book of life, he is forever safe from the second death. Something that the unbeliever is not. If you have not, you know, if rather, if Jesus Christ is not your Savior today, then you're in danger of the second death. Nay, you're condemned to the second death already. But you can uncond that, that condemnation can be undone. It is God who, un- who, who, who is able to undo that. God has promised eternal life to anyone who will humble himself before him. Repent of sin and put his trust in Christ. This means abandoning any and all efforts at self-justification, humbling yourself before God, and simply believing that Christ alone is the alpha and omega of your salvation. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he, might, that he may exalt you in due time. Not long ago, I preached, the stumbling, uh, I preached that the stumbling block of belief is pride. Imagine your own speechlessness if you stand before the righteous judge realizing all the squandered opportunities at, at salvation because you told yourself that Jesus was not the only way to God's presence. Or that you said, well, you know, hey, I'm still young. I've got lots of time. I've got news for you. You don't, you don't know your time. Your time is short. Eternity is long. And the judgment of God is sure and unchanging. If you're still holding out against Christ or resolve to hold out against God for any variety of reason, Familiarize yourselves with, the word, with these words of Christ because they will ring in your ears for all eternity as you burn unendingly. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, and then I will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Am I trying to scare you? No, I'm not trying to scare you. But I am telling you the truth. Jesus Christ died for you because he loves you. He loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. He took on the penalty of sin in your place. Should death be fearful? Well, it depends whether you're saved or you're not saved. If you get defensive when people speak, uh, when people speak about death, then I put it to you, then you're, you know, there is a problem. Examine that salvation against scriptures and see if that's genuine or not. If you're not saved today, hey, salvation is, you know, is near. For God is not willing that you should perish, but that you should come to repentance. Right? Are you ready to do business with God? Are you ready to put the fear of death behind you? And you actually look forward to the day that you're absent from this body. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time, for the preaching of your word. Father, we just ask that um, the Spirit of God will help all those here uh, to examine themselves um, to see if they be saved or not. And for those uh, who are not saved, that they can be saved even today. And that, they, 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 and that they, they can be free from the bondage of the fear of death. So Lord, I just ask that you do the work. Father, we pray also for um, a pastor Sung for the preaching of the, of the, of the sermon ahead that you pour your spirit upon him. For the, uh, for the power of the preaching of your word. 
So Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do. Give us a good week ahead. And um, we commit this prayer into your hands and thank you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Have a good week ahead. Bye-bye.